While much of Ontario prides itself on its diversity, we are not so naive as to believe that there still aren't some problems to solve. The province conducted several public consultations last year, the result being a three-year anti-racism plan. It brings the minister responsible for anti-racism to our studio tonight. Michael Coteau is also the Minister for Children and Youth Services and the Liberal MPP for Don Valley East, and we welcome you back here to TVO. Thank you for having me here. Not at all. Nice to see you. Your mandate as the minister responsible for anti-racism. Tell us what it is. To look for ways to remove barriers that exist within systems, um, including government, uh, to uh, allow more opportunity for Ontario. So removing systemic racism and really uh, putting in place a plan to fight racism here in the province of Ontario. If zero represents utter obstacle, terrible place to live, uh, you know, hatred of, uh, among different ethnic groups, and 10 is what Martin Luther King talked about in 1963, uh, not the color of your skin, but the content of your character, where's Ontario today? You know, that's a hard question to ask. Because, that's why I asked yeah. you, Minister. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, there's no question in my mind that if you look around the world, Ontario is a, it's an, it's an oasis. It is a place unlike any other place on this planet. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. We know that there are people out there um, in this province that um, uh, freely feel like they can express their, you know, their, their uh, racism in, in many different ways. It's in your face. Um, uh, but we also know that systems that we have in place because of colonialism, because of historical factors, have uh, allowed some people to excel and some people to be held back. So I think uh, there's no question that Ontario is one of, you know, one of the best places on the planet, but I honestly believe that there's an economic argument and just a social justice argument to be made that can allow Ontario to even be better than it is today. Give me an example of systemic discrimination that you think still exists in the province today. So... Um, Look at look in government. Look in the OPS, for example. Ontario Public Service. You go into the public service. Um, you go into boardrooms. You meet senior management. It doesn't really reflect uh, the Ontario that you and I would see if we're walking down the street. You know the fact that you know a small percentage, I think single digit doc, uh, percentage of doctors who arrive who are trained overseas actually arrive to Ontario, and none of them can really get through. I think it's like seven or eight percent that end up being doctors in Ontario. Um, things like sickle cell, you know, these are diseases that are specifically related to the color of one's skin. Um, the fact that doctors don't know how to diagnose it and, um, it, uh, you know, the treatments are, are not being um, done in an effective way. So it ends up costing you money, it, it ends up costing me money as a taxpayer uh, because we're not uh, removing those barriers that exist. So just so I'm super duper clear here, right. you are not in the business of trying to, part of your mission here is not really to eradicate racism in the province. It's to get these systemic barriers out of the way so people can have access to jobs, to housing, to Racism is always, racism has always been here. It's, a, it's very sophisticated. It changes its face. It has the ability to adjust quickly. My job is to look for ways to, uh, to identify the barriers that exist within organizations and institutions uh, based on a historical kind of context and uh, look for ways to remove it so we can, uh, we can maximize our human capital here in the province of Ontario and just make Ontario a fairer place for, for everyone. Can we get personal here for a second? Of course. You're a black man living in the province of Ontario. Right. Have you faced it yourself? You know, it's interesting. Granville Anderson and I were talking about this a couple of days ago. He's, another, just... he's a black, uh, black uh, MPP for Durham region. Right. You know, we talked about, you know, he was telling me a story of people driving by and, you know, just shouting out the N-word for no apparent reason. You know, that's happened to me before. But also, um, you know, being stopped and being asked for your identification, it happens all the time. But, you know, we're still in this Ontario where someone like me who's from Flemington Park, you know, parents have uh, below grade 10 education. My father fixed washing machines. Uh, my mother cleaned buildings. We could come as immigrants to Ontario and we, I could sit around a table with men and women uh, making, uh, making law and setting uh, direction for this province. So um, there are uh, some huge benefits here, but when we look at the larger population, and there are people who are successful, there's a lot of uh, success out there. But when we look at the numbers and we start to uh, dig a bit deeper, we see that there's a systemic issue at play here in the province of Ontario. I hear you, but you know, people will make the other observation that we have an openly gay premier. We have, right. uh, you know, you're barely 40 years old. You're a black man who's <laughs> in the cabinet. Um, you know, there are opportunities out there for those who are apparently willing to work hard and put the time right. in to get it done. So when we look at the, the big picture, we look at education, who's getting into universities, who's, who's graduating high schools. When we look at 
um, the criminal justice system and, and just justice in general, um, we see uh, overrepresentation. When we look at even uh, the, uh, the, the, when people die in this province, you know, the age and their health, um, there's these disparities that occur everywhere. And I, th I honestly believe that if we look at ways to eliminate some of those barriers, we can actually untap even more potential in this province to move forward. So we know in the United States, for example, racism, systemic racism and racism cost that country about $2 trillion a year uh, in lost revenue, about $100 billion in, uh, we, they could cut from services that are being used to support people who are not maximizing their full human capital potential. Um, so imagine those numbers. We know, for example, and I'll give you one example, in the Jane and Finch community, there's a federal document that came out that says um, the incarceration level for people who come from that one area is about $37 million a year. In Rosedale, it's zero. So think about that. Imagine even 10% with the policing uh, cost on top of that. It's almost $70 million for that one area. Could you imagine if we took 10% of that $70 million and just applied it to looking for ways to allow people to get into post-secondary, get into the training and uh, apprenticeship programs, you know, finish high school, uh, to avoid any, any kind of... Um, you know, entry in the criminal justice system to reach their full potential. There's an economic imperative here and there's a cost to standing still in the province of Ontario. So it is not in our financial self-interest to be racist. We know as Ontarians, we always say we have to, you know, aim for the higher ground and, it, you know, we have a, a moral imperative. But um, I was at the Economic Club a week and a half ago. It was the first time they had a speech on racism at the Economic Club of Canada. And my message to them was, um, you have to do this because there's a financial cost at play. Hmm. We had a discussion several months ago on the program. You just talked a second ago about the overrepresentation of, uh, I guess, what are called racialized communities in various right. aspects. Black and Indigenous children, for example, in care. And I want to play a little clip here of what Kike Ojo of the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies had to say about systemic racism in the province of Ontario. Sheldon, please. If you take away the systemic, the word syst systemic, the analysis is then that, I mean, if there are more black people in the system, there, might, there must be more of them doing maltreatment to their children. Not the I mean, case. And, and that's not the case. Hmm. And I think that's, so when we talk about systemic, we're talking about policies and practices that would have the system sort of focus in on that community more um, and, in a, and or um, use a lens that doesn't work for that community or a harsher lens, like a harsher use of discretion. These are some of the ways that, and, I mean, similar stories you hear in policing, similar stories you hear in, in, in education. So this is what we need to really get to the bottom to. How pervasive do you think this systemic racism, systemic, not, you know, right. in the schoolyard after, you know, how, how much of that is there in the province today? I think it's everywhere, um, you know, and the difficult thing about, and I talked about racism being very sophisticated, the thing about systemic racism, it, it can exist within an organization and you don't have to have racist people there. Uh, you don't have to have people who, you know, have uh, uh, ill thoughts about one particular group or another. It's just the way the system's been built. You know, a, a classic example of that is like, if we're gonna find someone we'll, you know, to bring into the company, we'll get someone who's kind of like us, you know, who, um, you know, who, uh, who reflects, you know, our, 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 you know, culture within the organization. And that could be translated into many different things. But we know that when you bring diversity into an organization, especially as globalization occurs more and we connect more. We've got something here that most uh, areas and jurisdictions don't have. We've got diversity. If we leverage it properly, we build our economy, we create more opportunities and people can have wonderful families and participate in all the beauty this province has to offer. As we suggested in the intro, you did a series of public consultations, across, 10 of them, I think. Eh? 10, right across, 10 the, across the province. Across the province. Let's, uh, Sheldon, should we put the highlights up here right now? Here's essentially what, I mean, these consultations obviously informed the strategy going forward that you've come up with. Here's we go. The development of a disaggregated race data collection framework and guidelines. I'm going to ask you more about what that means in a second. Anti-racism legislation. Address Islamophobia. Hold an annual anti-racism conference. Population-specific anti-racism initiatives, including anti-black racism strategy, an indigenous-focused anti-racism strategy. Okay, again, let's follow up on this disaggregated race data collection framework. Right. Can you tell me what that in English means? <laughs> <laughs> I always struggle to even say that word, but um, 
Uh, it's, a, a, I guess, a complicated way of saying that we'll develop tools um, organizations can use. And we're going to start off with the OPS uh, to do uh, a bit of a... Uh, Take a bit of a, um, a filter, a, a filter uh, through policy to see does that actual policy uh, take into account um, the needs of specific groups. So, you know, if we're, I'll give you a perfect example in the education system. Um, summertime, the kids are all, you know, they're all told they can go home and they're there for the summertime. We did that because of the agricultural society we had in Ontario. <laughs> Indigenous communities, and this is what I heard up in Thunder Bay, you know, their hunting season traditionally started in the fall. But yet the kids are released, brought into the school system, released over the summer, and then they go back, you know, go back to school in September, and then they leave traditionally to go out. And, of course, I'm talking about historically. Um, so, you know, you had a system that was built based on a European-centric uh, perspective on agriculture, yet it incorporated kids who uh, were from a culture that had the complete... Uh, reversal so of, uh, you, of subsidies. you move to change the school year? Then? Well, it's not specific. I'm using that as, as an example. I know Minister Hunter has talked a lot about um, it, moving forward with uh, race-based uh, data collection. And we're moving forward as a government to look for ways to better uh, support Indigenous communities and work with them at the, at the, at the decision table. But let's just understand what this means. Yeah. Does this potentially mean Indigenous kids will go to school over the summertime and, and be out of school in, say, September, October. So what it, what it means is when any decision is being made in government that applies to the livelihood or it will affect uh, a person here in Ontario, um, you have to apply that kind of filter to better understand is the policy decision reflective of the, those cultural needs and um, is it actually uh, you know, working in a way that um, does not create any form of barriers uh, in, you know, that allow people, some people to, uh, to advance and some people to be held back. You have an anti-black racism strategy, obviously. Right. What's that going to encompass? So um, anti-black racism is, um, you know, very complex because um, black people, like historically black people, have been here for hundreds of years. Um, slavery, obviously, in this province, uh, in this country, uh, in North America, many, you know, many people who are here uh, who are black uh, came through that, that passage. But um, we want to make sure that... Um, you know, this being one of the oldest forms of racism here in, in, in Ontario, and um, black youth and black people being probably um, the most overrepresented in certain areas like child welfare and in, in, in the youth justice system, uh, and uh, not getting into post-secondary at the same levels of other groups. We want to make sure that as we move forward, we're developing policy that takes those things into account. So, for example, uh, if a young person uh, is, um, if someone's called into a home of a black student uh, or a black child and you're making a decision point, and let's say, for example, black people suffer from a higher percentage of poverty than, uh, than the rest uh, of, uh, of, of society as a whole. So if that's true, uh, we know that there's been cases where child welfare has gone in and removed a child because of poverty reasons. Is that a reason why you should be pulling out a child from a, a family that loves them and placing them into private care that costs more than just looking for ways to put a bit of food back on the table? Mm -hmm. So those are the questions we need to ask. And those are, you know, these are the things we need to change because you know, taking that child from that family because of poverty and placing them into, into pr child protection ends up costing the system more and it destroys that family. Well, they always say facts are friendly, so let's put up a pie chart here showing some facts. Sheldon, if you would. This is from the Toronto Police Service, and the chart suggests that it's the Jewish community that is the most victimized group. Uh, I wonder whether there is an anti-Semitism initiative as part of this new three-year anti-racism strategic plan. Well, I think that's a great question, and um, uh, there is, um, if you look through the document, we talk a lot about um, anti-Semitism here in the province of Ontario. And you're absolutely right, the number one reported hate crime in the city of Toronto is from the Jewish community. Um, but when we talk about systemic racism, and this is why data collection is, is good, and uh, the strategy calls for legislation that will uh, allow us to mandate organizations and ministries to collect that type of data. When we look at, um, uh, when we look at again, uh, in healthcare um, outcomes, when we look in education outcomes, employment numbers, when we look at uh, involvement in uh, criminal justice system, uh, what you will see is that there's an overrepresentation of racialized people, mm -hmm. and mainly black and indigenous. Mm 
So yes, the uh, Jewish community, like racism is happening and hate crimes are there. We're working with the uh, Attorney General to ensure that um, the processes are in place to report those things. Uh, but we also know that when it comes to reporting, so for example, seven of the top 10 places for reported hate crime in this entire country are here in Ontario. Uh, Thunder Bay and Hamilton being uh, uh, first place. Uh, so the question is, is Hamilton and Thunder Bay, are they just doing a better job in collecting that data than other jurisdictions? Or is there actually more hate crime taking place? Because you've got other what's jurisdictions. The, what's the answer? We don't know. Hmm. And this is why we need to start you know, collecting the right type of data. We don't have a framework uh, to actually collect that right, right type of data. One thing I do know about the Jewish community, because of the historical context, and you know, if you look internationally, the Jewish community have been overwhelmingly the, the recipients of much hate internationally and here in Ontario. Uh, they've done a good job to uh, work with police forces to get, you know, reporting in. Uh, we need to learn from what they've been doing because I'll tell you, when, um, you know, when a hate crime occurs to a young black boy who's 14, 15, he's not going to go, chances are, he's not going to go and report that to the police because no. there's, there's a distrust there as well, right? I hear you. Um, right. However, comma, the Jewish community may very well come forward and say something like, it's true. The black communities in the province of Ontario right. and the indigenous communities in the province of Ontario are certainly doing worse than the Jewish communities in the province of Ontario today. But the numbers suggest that crimes against hate crimes against Jews are actually worse. I agree. So why is there no pro why is there no so program it, for the it, Jewish community? It is in here. Um, there are some pieces like we are going to do, for example, a, an educational awareness campaign. All of our schools. Um, um, and uh, the anti-Semitism is a big component of that. In addition to that, uh, we do have representation from the Jewish uh, community on a small advisory committee that we have. So moving forward, we're going to work with the Jewish community, uh, with the Muslim community, black community, indigenous communities, all communities seek community. We have representation to look for ways to better position Ontario. So we eliminate that type of hate. Uh, there's no question in my mind that um, Jewish people, and through my consultations in different parts of Ontario, um, there is, um, there is uh, often fear at community centres, uh, places of, of worship. Um, the security costs alone within these, uh, these organisations are just so overwhelming. Um, there is a, um, a big challenge they have in the community. So I've, um, I'm aware of these things and we've been working internally to look for ways to uh, better position that. But uh, make no mistake, when you look through this document, um, it speaks about anti-Semitism being one of the key focuses of this government. Okay. Judge Michael Tulloch, as you know, recently released his report on police oversight bodies. And I wonder if there is a connection between what he's suggested and what you're trying to do here. There, there's obviously a, a connection. Um, you know, the judge did um, an incredible job um, bringing forward a, uh, a proposal to, uh, to government, the recommendations. But he is working directly with uh, Yasser Nakvi, uh, the attorney general. Um, but, um, for example, um, you know, when uh, Nakvi, Minister Nakvi uh, moved forward on the carding policy, so these are the, you know, we, we put in place um, within that piece of legislation or that regulation a piece that would allow the anti-racism directorate to be part of that review process. So there is natural connections, but, you know, we're focusing on systemic racism and removing barriers that exist that, uh, again, allow some people to excel and some people to, uh, to, not, to, to be kept back. My job is to make sure that um, at the end of the day that everyone has a fair chance in the province of Ontario. And it's not about, it's not about saying, you know, let's give this person a, a head start or giving them a one-up. It's about saying we, we want there to be no friction or barriers in place that, you know, that keep people back. And racism is costing us as Ontarians. Well, let's finish up on this. Uh, I, I guess one of the lessons of Donald Trump's election down in the States was that there, there are a whole lot of people, there are millions of people down south who are white and in their middle 50s and you know the manufacturing sector has taken a turn and they may have lost their job in coal mines or in retail or making washing machines or whatever and they're kind of tired of being told all the time you're a racist and you got it better than right. lots of other people and they just that that's not what they want to hear and trump obviously gave voice to that right. feeling uh, now, I don't know how many of those people are in the province of Ontario today, but I'm willing to bet that there's a bunch. And I wonder whether you're concerned at all about taking what they might perceive to be a kind of staunch social justice warrior, you white people have had it right. good for a long time, when they don't think they've got it so good right now. 
You know, in Ontario, we have 170,000 young people that we um, refer to as uh, neat youth. So they're not employed uh, in education or any form of training. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those uh, young people are in rural communities, uh, places like Peterborough, Ontario, uh, place, places like Hamilton. Um, so if we want to unleash the full potential of this province, we can't forget about those young people. When I was in Peterborough, I met a principal and she told me she uh, donated some, uh, some of her husband's uh, shirts to this young boy at the school because he wasn't wearing, a young white boy. And um, he came back the next day and asked if, um, if the principal had any uh, underwear. Uh, because he didn't have any underwear. So we can't forget about anyone in this province. You know, um, there are young white men, you know, growing up in Flemington Park, I know young white guys who are brought into the criminal justice system who, you know, have problems finding employment. We can't forget about people, but this is a, um, a specific area. We know that by 2031, 40% of this province will be racialized. We have um, probably the most aggressive immigration policy in the world. Um, if we don't if we do not put in place the right type of process today, uh, there's going to be a cost. There's a cost to standing still. And if we don't dismantle systemic racism today, it's not only going to affect racialized communities, it's going to affect that, that white guy in Peterborough um, who's struggling himself. We will continue to watch this with interest. Thank you for Michael your time. Michael Coto, who is the minister responsible for Ontario's three-year anti-racism strategic plan. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.